Welcome to Masters of Regeneration Radio. Conversations with humans who dare to reimagine our place on planet Earth. Earth is changing fast. Evolution happening in real time. An intimate, circular understanding of nature and living systems. We are the land. The land is us. Welcome, everyone, to the Masters of Regeneration podcast. This is Tomas Reyes. I'm very excited today because we have Tom Scalic from the Paul Allen Frontiers Group here. Just a quick reminder that the Masters of Regeneration podcast, the purpose of this podcast is to help everyone to reconnect to an evolutionary understanding of our place on the planet and to also reconnect to a cyclical understanding of our relationship with the environment. So we could argue that we live in a very exciting and challenging time at the same time. And, and I'm very excited to be talking to, to Tom today because, well, you'll see in a second, but he and, and, and the group he works with address a fundamental issue of the upcoming fifth revolution or the internet of species, as he says. Hello, Thomas. How are you? <laughs> very good. Very good. Um, thank you so much for making the time to, to be here on the podcast. My pleasure. So let's talk about organizing biological information flows. That's a big undertaking. <laughs> Is it something like the Google of living systems or, or, inf or biological information flows? Can we talk a, bit, a little bit about the fifth revolution and has it started already or are we, is it, is it something that's already happening? Yeah, I, I think it would be uh, correct to think about the fifth revolution as having started yeah. with the sequencing of the genome, which of course Many people know about, and it was related to trying to cure human diseases, but what it's led to now is this uh, incredible capability in modern science that is the confluence of multiple things, increased computing power and increasing ability to store huge amounts of data than we ever could before on the one hand, yeah. and on the other hand, that we understand we don't know very much yet about living systems on our planet Earth. We really only know how a few plant and animal species really work. And, and even fewer do we know their genes, and even fewer do we know the interactions among species. This is really the very, very complex information flows, as you said. Uh, between species, even sharing genes every day, every day in any street, in the gutter, you have gene flow laterally between species when, when there's an infection occurring, when there's a virus that's acquired. This, this new set of capabilities, um, understanding that we know very little about biology and all the species on Earth, and the amazing ability with technology, computing, computer modeling to understand them better has really now opened a, a, a new possibility to understand more about living systems and their interdependent cycles and, and actually what it does mean to be alive. Um, you know, I, I think human beings have gotten a sense, we're a little bit um, introspective, shall we say, or self-absorbed in the sense that we viewed the human species and our ability to harness nature as being the key element of technological progress. And, you yeah. know, as an example, the modern world has narrowed to, or limited itself to things like wheat in food production or yes. cotton, the cotton plant in textile production. And if any any of your listeners looks at what they're wearing today, they're gonna see an animal or a plant product on their body, whether it's a cotton textile or a wool, perhaps, or maybe on their feet, they see the product of an animal, like leather shoes. Yeah, yeah. But, but now we know we've only scratched the surface. So we only know a small percent of the plant and animal species on earth 
and what niches they fill in the ecosystem and the complex information flow between these niches. So I think, yes, we're at a, we're at a revolutionary moment and the revolution has already started that we're beginning to appreciate. And I think that's the first step, uh, which I think you, you recognize in, in, in this uh, series that you appreciate that we're just at the cusp of this revolution. But yeah. I do think we have now the ability at least to understand life on earth better and then to uh, begin to exist a little bit uh, better in harmony with that complexity. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a fascinating point with the the with, with the with the genome and the epigenome and the microbiome and discovering all these these aspects of of ourselves and the complexity of of not being a fixed a product of nature, but rather a living process, right? And um, epigenetics fascinates me in the sense of of placing ourselves in an evolutionary timeline and understanding that certain things about our genetics, about your genetics and your body and how it works today, are are just a result of of um, influences that come from previous generations. I don't know how far. I don't know if you if you have more information about that, and that we will in turn pass that on to our progeny and, and, and that everything in the environment is affecting how our genes are expressed. Yeah. Yes. So epigenetics is part of this revolution, which means um, the, the, that anything that happens to you in your life can affect your bodily function and your health your happiness, you know, your well-being. And that this includes, you know, I, I think of it sort of as an equation. It's the genes you get from your parents plus the environment. So it's like capital G for genes plus the environment with a big E yeah. equals your health. And, and this is true for any species, not just human beings. But that big E, the big environment, includes things like foods, you know, what are the chemical uh, entities that we put in our bodies, and uh, it includes things like air and water and or air and water pollution, and it includes your stress in stressful societies, if you've experienced conflict and so forth. These, these create very real biological information flow and changes to the epigenome. And, you know, you can think of the epigenome, it's just a control system. It's like the buttons on your computer or the keys or the little, um, the little um, uh, buttons on your iPhone or, you know, the knobs on a radio if you're an old style, you know, radio uh, audiophile. Yeah. And, and you can turn the knobs up and down by half or a little bit, you can turn the volume up, you can turn the bass up, if you like bass, and so on. Yeah, yeah. That's actually what's happening in our genes, that the epigenetics tunes your genes. It's like playing a symphony. And everything you eat, everything you're exposed to out in the world, your interpersonal stress level or your happiness level, absolutely turns your control knobs. And that's epigenetics. Yeah. And for things like diseases of aging like Alzheimer's. Everyone right now is very worried about the onset of Alzheimer's and the aging population being a big burden on society. But actually only 20% of your cognitive function when you're over say 50 years old is related to what you got from your parents in terms of genes, maybe 20%. The other 80% is what happened to you during life. And what oh, you that's fascinating. Yeah, that's yeah fascinating. and how many, how many flus you had, how many infectious diseases. Absolutely. Your choices, your lifestyle, the food that yeah. you ate most likely and yeah, fascinating. Do we know anything about how information flows from one species to the other to the to to another? I mean, I Yeah. The only thing I've ever read about that was um I think in Evolving Ourselves by Juan Enriquez. Oh yeah. He was he mentioned that some scientists would argue that the virome is probably responsible mostly for interspecies communication, for gene flow between, I don't know, trees and water and ourselves or, I don't know. Yes. No, exactly. That's exactly right. So okay. um, there, there are elements called mobile genetic elements. 
And what happens when one species um, interacts, or in the case of a virus, we say we get infected by a virus. It just means that this, this particular um, object is taking up uh, residence in our cells, maybe in some of our cells, maybe in all of our cells. And it's, it's, it's leaving behind some, some genetic material, some actual uh, DNA. And, and that same thing may have uh, existed in a mouse or some other um, you know, parasite or some other species in the ecosystem. So absolutely, mobile genetic elements are a way to transfer viruses um, across um, species. And of course, um, the, the genes of any species can also randomly change. And this has been historically thought to be the basis of evolution that you have kind of random evolutions in, or I'm sorry, changes in your genes. And then if it makes you more suitable for life, you know, you're better able to run and hunt, or you're better able if you're a bird to seek out a nut in a little crevice of a rock or something, you might have a competitive advantage or a selection advantage, and you would grow faster than other. Yeah. But, but this is complicated because in any population, whether it's a human village, or a, a bird population or insect population, you know, it's interesting to think of it. You, you can't really have everybody be an explorer or a pioneer. If everybody sailed out in search of the next treasure, who's <laughs> gonna stay at home and keep the house clean and, and do everything? So yeah. you actually need uh, uh, groups of people in every population that are the workers and the people that stay around and take care of the children and the house and the, the villages and the streets and the roads. And then you need other people to go out and sail the seven seas and find new, new uh, territories to explore. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you need a, and you need a balance. So, you, so the genome actually varies tremendously among individuals in a given population, which is another really interesting element. Fascinating. Um, I always bring that back to food just because that's, you know, I'm a chef and, and, and that's what I, I kind of bring people into this discussion through food and through the awareness of, um, of, of our place in what is the food chain, which is life on the planet, basically. It's, yeah. it's, um, I tell my students sometimes that, you know, that just to realize that we are food, that everything is food, and that's how life happens, and at least our bodies. I don't know about the soul and all those things, you know, um, but your body will definitely um, be broken down into nutrients and, and, and give back to the soil a bunch of information, a bunch of genetic and, and nutrient information. Um, so... We have the epigenome, we have the genome, the epigenome, the microbiome, the virome, um, and we're just scratching the surface of these interactions. How, when I, when I, 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 was, I was fascinated by the article you wrote about the fifth revolution and by the idea that you will tackle the organization of biological, of the world's biological information flows. Um, is that like what Google has done with the internet, but with biological information flows or what does that mean? Ah, uh, um, well, to I organize think, that information flow. I yeah, guess. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yes, it is. So, so I think it's important to put it in that context. It's a matter of scale. So there are many economic organizations now, like, like Google or Amazon or other big ones, IBM and so forth, that are really looking to be part of an industrial revolution, uh, which is um, maybe the fourth revolution, which is um, uh, the Internet of Things, you know, how everything is connected and we all feel we're under surveillance or we give our data with a credit card and yeah. then all of a sudden you know, we're known uh, more broadly in the world. And it's concerning when it affects uh, the political process or it affects your ability to have a credit score or your ability to get a, um, you know, a, uh, some food delivered to your house at a certain time. But um, as big as that industry may be, what's interesting is that the size of biological information flow dwarfs the size of the internet of things. And so, 
Um, that's estimated to be a $20 billion um, industry um, just in a few years. So I think probably our dependence on food supply and clean water and the regional distribution of food and water will be an even bigger and more important industry. And right now, of course, it's known by your industry, you know, the food industry or by chefs and people who professionally are involved with that. But I think we're going to see a return to something I call benevolent regionalism, which is that regions will begin to exist um, in a healthier um, and in a more harmonious relationship with the living things around them, which will improve uh, food availability and clean water availability. Yeah. So I think, um, uh, yeah, it's a big challenge. So what does the information flow really mean? Well, it means, first of all, if you think about something like Uber, yeah. this is viewed as a technological marvel, in, you know, and it's putting taxis out of business, of course, in some cases. But it's, it's also nice because a car shows up and takes you wherever you want to go very easily. But, you know, that's a very simple system because all it has in terms of data is where a person is standing yeah. and where a car might be moved to come and pick them up. And now if you think about where you're going to get your next meal, it's much, much, much more complicated. Because if you look at the ingredients of any uh, typical meal that's prepared, often the food ingredients are sourced, you know, globally or at least, you know, nationally, very rarely only regionally. And um, they're super complex because they've all... Um, you know, enjoyed a certain carbon flux. They've gotten electron flow from the sun, from sunlight through photosynthesis, typically either directly in plants, vegetables, fruits, yeah. or else the animals that have consumed that those energy flows. And controlling those metabolic processes or energy flows, which of course result in what we know as carbohydrates, fats, proteins, you know, the things that are typically in our food that we think about, yeah. Those are all chemical products that have been produced through very complex transfer of information. Yes. And that information flow is regulated by the epigenome, or by the genes, right? Because the genes and the epigenes control the enzymes that process everything, whether it's your metabolic rate or, or you know, how fast you're aging or your stress levels and so forth. So it's a very complex interconnected system, much, much more complicated than, say, Uber or yeah. you know, um, ordering a book on Amazon. Absolutely. So I think um, the first thing is that we need to get information about all the species, like I said, not focus on only a few farmed crops or a few you know, animals that are currently cultivated, but really understand that these are very complex systems that have evolved and therefore offer tremendous adaptive capability. So I'm very optimistic about this future in which we know more about living things because it'll open a world of possibilities beyond the current very limited view of how we produce food and, and, and get water. Yeah. There is, there is a movement, um, a regenerative agriculture movement brewing all over the world. And yeah. it's all about... Um, feeding the soil and, and creating the conditions for the soil to become richer and richer every year. After the harvest, the soil is not depleted. It is richer than the previous year just because of the, the change, the, the paradigm change in, in, in managing the crops or, or the animals and thinking in terms of managing an ecosystem as opposed to managing a product, let's say a carrot or yeah. a potato or some onions, right? Yes. Um, how that's a perfect, yeah, that's a perfect example. In fact, I'd say that emerging movement yes. is a much more exciting and potentially uh, socially productive movement than most of the software applications that we use today. So, and, yeah. and, 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 and you know, what's happening in the regenerative farming and the soil enrichment sort of, you know, approaches is all very empirical. I guess that's really the point to link it back to the information flow and the fifth revolution. What you'd want to do in there is really know more about that very complex ecosystem. Right now, we really don't know much 
about all the bacteria that's in the soil and the worms. You know, you asked earlier about how long epigenetics uh, and, and the information flow can last, or let's say a change in your genetics can last. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Some uh, worms, flatworms, have been, uh, have been the same for a million years. And if you cut them in half, they'll regrow perfectly. The, they, they have a program that they can perfectly recapture their head or their tail. They even retain their memory. If you cut their head off wow. and they regrow, they remember <laughs> where they were looking for food before you cut their head off. It's a, wow, absolutely that's fascinating. amazing. So I like to say worms have already solved immortality. <laughs> it's that's really awesome. amazing. Yeah. Wow, that's a fascinating example. That's crazy. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, um, the going back to the regenerative uh, agriculture movement, um, there's this fascinating chef called Dan Barber, and he has a beautiful book called The Third Plate, where he explained his journey of rediscovering the soil and growing things and, and making the soil so rich in nutrients that vegetables are not attacked by pests just because they're too healthy right and and so i'm, I'm really interested in, in that process of each of us changing our mindset from this sort of separated um existence from the ecosystem to this understanding of of living systems and the whole cycle of of information of, of biological information between us and the environment and, and how we can create the conditions for to improve or create the conditions for nature to do what it does best, which is to evolve in the best possible way, in the healthiest possible way or something. Um, how do you see that the fourth, the fifth, sorry, revolution will in other ways harness that power of, of living systems and, and, and we can produce cleaner energy and food and, and water and, and I mean, it's happening yeah. in, in transportation a little bit. Elon Musk is doing it, you know, um, I mean, yeah, are there, do you have any other examples of, of how this is happening right now? Oh yeah. It, it's, it's, um, again, it's a revolution waiting to happen. Let me, I can give you a few examples okay. right now. The construction industry is the most wasteful, human industry on the planet. I think the construction industry wastes about 30% in, you know, producing trash as wow. they're constructing uh, new buildings. Okay. And, um, you know, that's really unacceptable. Uh, actually, you know, if we were just to recycle all the current structures on earth, you know, brick walls, stones, wood, etc., cetera, concrete, and, and made it into new housing and um, productive factories and so forth, we wouldn't have to build anything new because we, we've already built so many things. So how does nature build? Nature is much more efficient at um, building. And the reason is because the way nature works, because again, of epigenetics and genetics, you make little tiny pieces one at a time, you know, either a protein or something like that. And these granular elements are then assembled into this amazing array of fabrics and organs like hearts or brains or bone and so forth. And current manufacturing is so crude by comparison. We mostly use high temperature and yeah. high pressure yeah. to, make, to make things. What nature does is work at low pressure and low temperature to make <laughs> things that are equally durable and equally complex and equally functional, if not more so, than a jet airplane or a bridge or you know, the houses that we live in. And, and they do it with less, less uh, a waste. Um, that's, a, that's a fascinating example. <laughs> So can you so can you imagine a living wall? Why not have a let's, yeah. let's grow walls for our houses or let you know and, and windows or you know elements of the built environment that we're living in? I think may be eventually manufactured at lower temperature and pressure with less waste. Yeah, and that's probably one of the biggest industries that needs to be um, transformed. And, and materials that are hopefully, I mean, I, I will always think about this. When, 
when are we going to start seeing um, materials that are so advanced in, in synthetic biology, let's say, that we can't really tell the difference between, you know, yeah. the living raw material, let's say wood or or something like that, and the one we created, and it's and it's something that's communicating with its with the environment, um, the in a way in a more natural, <laughs> if you will, way, just just the way nature does, and, you know, it's. it's yeah, absolutely, and that's happening. That's happening now. So there's a company called, for example, Memphis Meats in the United States. Yeah, is a is a company producing um, meat um, products using a synthetic biology process, and these have been actually cooked into hamburgers by by top chefs and served to customers with with really great results. People say it's quite tasty and so forth. Um, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure yeah. they've completely <laughs> captured all the elements of a natural meat product, however, or protein yeah. product, yeah. because they don't have all the um, interstitial matrix, you know, the proteins that connect the muscle cells and other elements. So, and in terms of, you know, being nutritious uh, in a way that's different than, a, you know, an industrial product or even a, a feedlot, you know, piece of meat. Yeah. Um, I, I would say they haven't captured all the complexity yet. But it's yeah. definitely heading. It's heading in that direction, to some degree. Is that um, something like Impossible Foods? The way that they do, they grab, I think, hemoglobin from plants or something like that, in high concentration to create burgers made of plants that taste like blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like blood, blood sausage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't. I, I don't know. It's fascinating to see what is going to come out of that. Um, I, I yeah, wonder. And, and I yeah, and synthetic biology will produce many, many other products. You know, you think about rubber, for example. You know, which we see all around us in everyday life, or, or you know, petroleum products, which of course are the source source of a lot of. Um, CO2 in the atmosphere, which yeah. is causing global warming, which is then affecting our ability to grow plants on earth and forests and clean our waters and so forth. You know, plants have a lot to do with, you know, creating clean water, of course. So, um, so I think we'll see perhaps as some of these um, building materials, which are used in very, very large amounts all around the world, can be replaced by some synthetic materials, like a synthetic rubber, synthetic wood, or it wouldn't have to be a wood, but it would have to be a, a material with the structural characteristics that we currently use wood for, and yeah. that would then replace the structural function. Yeah. You know, it wouldn't it wouldn't replace a tree, but it would replace the structural function of wood. That would be really desirable. That sounds very desirable. Yes, not having to cut any more trees. <laughs> um, yeah. The other, the other uh, positive aspect of regenerative agriculture is that um, the soil is a great carbon sequestration tool if yeah. managed properly and, and, and rich enough. And, um, but the problem is monocultures and monocrops, sorry, and, and feedlots, which are kind of like systems that are disconnected from, from, from natural cycles. Right. Know, right. Great. Um, so, well, carbon, yeah, carbon sequestration. Uh, most people don't realize if we could, for example, regrow uh, seagrasses in shallow water coastal ecosystems mm -hmm. all around the world, which is where eighty percent of the population on on Earth lives within fifty miles of a coast. Yeah, we could we could get tremendous ecosystem services like storm buffers against big storms and hurricanes. For those regions, but we, and and we could grow the small fish that are then of course the large fish um, feed on, and then yeah. recreate some of our protein systems in the oceans. But well beyond that, these shallow water uh, seagrasses would sequester tremendous amounts of carbon. So we could actually save the world literally by preventing you know global warming if we were to be able to essentially replant and regrow a very rich uh, system of seagrass all around our shallow waters. 
And by seagrass, you mean kelp and other seaweeds? Or? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Eelgrass and so forth. Kelp, eelgrass, yeah, all these forms um, that grow in the shallow water where sunlight is available um, are a tremendous source of carbon sequestration that's really not very well appreciated and also helps with, of course, the um, ocean, um, well, protein systems, if you will. Fishing is an age-old you know, human activity yeah. and, cert- and source of protein. But, of course, we're depleting our fisheries. And a, a big part of it is because you know, all the little ones don't have a home because we've taken away all the, the ecosystem, yeah. the seagrasses, which yeah. is where they live and grow up. Those are their villages. Yeah, and yeah. we've taken them away. Yeah. How have we taken them away? Just, oh, just through, uh, through pacification overfishing. or overfishing. Yeah, overfishing on the one hand, but uh, and then of course development in yeah. coastal areas of you know construction and so forth. But actually, it relates most importantly back to something that you mentioned earlier, the monoculture. So the biggest cause of degraded uh, seagrasses in in shallow water coastal regions is the is the farming that takes place along the rivers upstream in a given watershed. So the human population exists on the earth. I think of it like a jigsaw puzzle or a quilt. It's like a quilt work of watersheds. You know, a watershed is where a river comes down from a mountain and has nice water. And we've used water for you know millennia in human civilization to grow crops yeah. for textiles and for food. And those rivers have then flow into the ocean. And what happens along the rivers is that the farmers, when they switch to monoculture to try to produce more, to to, to produce more revenue in these monoculture markets, um, they put more nitrogen, of course, fertilizer, and they do monoculture. And that has the result that there's more more runoff and the nitrogen-rich water goes into the uh, ocean and then creates low oxygen environments and and kills the seagrass and creates sediment, all kinds of things that that kill off the uh, the seagrasses. So actually, the monoculture in the farming along the rivers is is the biggest determinant of the health of the uh, coastal ecosystem. Yeah, I um, I'll I'll make a, a Colombian parenthesis. Right now I'm in Colombia, I'm in Bogota, and I am going to interview this, this woman who works with um, Cooperation International, I believe, and they work with high mountain wetlands. Yeah. And these are beautiful landscapes here in Colombia where there are these sort of high mountain cactus type plants that, are, that have a little fur on their leaves. They're more related to sunflowers, but they, they kind of look like a cactus, but it's, it's not a dry region at all. It's completely wet. And they, they, what they do is they capture a lot of uh, water from the atmosphere and bring, bring it into the ground. Mm-hmm. And the, the two main threats to the health of those ecosystems up there in the Andes are potatoes and onions, <laughs> monocrops, oh. right? Mm-hmm. Before mining, they're... You know, the most damaging to. So, you know, trying to how we communicate this to to food producers and it's yeah fascinating times. Well, I think I th- I think there's a way to do that is to build. I think we we should take use of t- modern technology in gaming. And I think if we could get the large producers and the um, financial backers of large producers and, you know, logistical network providers and so forth to all play a game, I think we could create interactive computer games, which everyone is familiar with now. And it lets you really put yourself in someone else's shoes and see why, why is a farmer uh, pursuing monoculture? Yeah. And heavy nitrogen. Why is another farmer pursuing, you know, po- you know, polyculture and organic methods and so forth? And why would a, you know, a factory owner pollute a river? Or, you know, why would we preserve a high mountain, you know, wetlands? Why, or why should a fisherman not catch every fish that that he or she finds in in a given area? Or buy a new boat to go faster? 
and then you you can you can learn about the whole ecosystem by by putting yourself in the place of the other person. And, and you understand. would either deplete your resources or or save resources or things like that. Yeah, it, it gives you the a little bit different perspective and maybe avoid what's known, of course, as the tragedy of the commons, where everyone just catches or grows as much as they can, uh, you know, in the shortest possible time. And eventually, of course, that depletes the soil or depletes the fisheries yeah. and so forth. Yeah, so you need a little different perspective to think about it differently. Are you doing any of that? Are you developing any video games? Yeah, well, there's a very good one that was developed actually at my old university, the University of Virginia, um, on the East Coast. Um, okay. It was called uh, the, we started with a model of the Chesapeake Bay, which is the largest um, watershed or estuary in the United States. And we thought okay. if we could do it, for, and there's six big rivers that come into the Chesapeake Bay. So it was very complicated. And we did. We built a model um, that you could play. And we had fishermen and farmers and politicians and factory owners, students, young people, parents. We had them play the game. And they all learned from each other. And we found that without the behavior or the learning from the game, basically the iconic species of the Chesapeake Bay, the blue crabs, would be dead by you know 2022. But wow. if you could make some adjustments in your behaviors, then um, you could actually save the blue crabs. That's and, and, and they've actually applied that game since to other regions like the Murray Darling Basin in Australia, which is now under tremendous pressure and essentially running dry. It's the biggest watershed in Australia. Uh, have looked at it and the Brazos uh, River in Houston which has a lot of chemical refineries, but also is a very important watershed, yeah. um, and, and others. So, it, yeah, this kind of game can be applied to any um, ecosystem problem and um, get important learnings that, that help the uh, ecosystem to be healthy. Is that something um, that's open source and can be replicated, and can anyone use it, or...? or How does, yeah. how does it work? So we, so we never, we never um, got enough financial backing to make it into a completely easy to use package that you could just download you know, on your phone or your computer. Oh, But you I can see. certainly look at all of it. And yes, you could, you, could get, you could play the game if you contact them. Uh, it's called um, uh, the UVA. Bay Game, B-A-Y Game. UVA Bay Game was the Chesapeake Bay. And then the, the broader version is called the Global Water Games. Global, the global water, games. water Games. That yeah. is awesome. and if you type that in to Google, it should come up with an example of these two games. And if, then if you contact them, they could, they could uh, provide the, uh, the, the code and the, and the model, uh, you know, and then you could set up a local gameplay. Wow, that's fascinating. That, that, yeah, I mean, I'll definitely check it out, and I recommend that everybody listening to this episode also checks it out. It's, um, yeah, it sounds like a, like a great tool to understand all the yeah. players. In the, in right, the because really, essentially, it's about behavior. It's about human behavior change. Yeah, and and some sometimes a gaming, a participatory game where you really participate. You don't just hear it or read it or read the newspaper, but you actually participate and see the results of your own actions. Yeah, <laughs> but play, played out into the future. Yes. sometimes that can change. That can change behavior uh, more effectively. That sounds amazing. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so you were telling me also about the work that you do at this other university with regeneration. What was it? Um, yeah, um, uh, Tufts, Tufts University. Tufts University, yes. Uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. It's uh, uh, in their uh, biology department. There's a uh, really pioneering scientist named Michael... Levin, um, and he has been studying how a very primitive uh, property of living systems, which is the electrical communications, 
uh, between cells, which we all have and we all know because right, that's how we move our hand when yes. we reach for a glass or it's how we walk down the street. That's because your brain is sending electrical signals to your muscles to do something. So, you know, motion is life and, it, and motion is controlled by electrical signals. And everyone knows your brain. That's how we think, that's how we talk, is how we learn language, make music, is you know, electrical activity in your brain. But his idea was really, really uh, provocative and fundamental, which is that, you know, the human brain has just specialized this, this characteristic of how cells communicate using electrical signals. What about the rest of your tissues? How about your skin? How about your liver or your kidney? And his idea is that all your cells communicate electrically. So let's say in regenerative medicine, so let's say you have an accident and you lose a finger. Why can't we grow back a finger in an adult human being? And his idea yeah. is that if we had the right electrical patterning on the tissue, we should be able to essentially uh, regrow a tissue or regenerate tissue. Okay. And he calls this hacking the morphogenetic code or reading and writing the morphogenetic code. Morphogenesis is simply the process of creating shape in a living system. So yeah. we all have shape. You know, we have two arms, we have two legs, we have one head, you know, and trees have a shape, they have a trunk, they have leaves. This is called morphogenesis. And he thinks that bioelectricity controls morphogene morphogenetic codes and shapes, you know, how to grow, when to grow, when to stop growing, when to grow if you're injured, etc. And so if we could work out this morphogenetic code, you could do things like prevent cancer, because after all, cancer yeah. is just an abnormal shape. So if you could if you could rewrite the regular shape, there'd be no room for cancer. Yeah. And the same would be true in plants. You know, you could you could uh, grow a, a tastier tomato or something like that. You know, you could accelerate the process of uh, plant breeding that that farmers have used, of course, for thousands of years. But you could do it with a little more intelligence and a little more speed. That's fascinating. Is Michael uh, the one working with flatworms and how they regrow their heads with memories and everything? Exactly. <laughs> okay. Yes. Gotcha. That's great. Um, yeah. So, so, yeah. 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 So I joke with him that flatworms have solved the problem of immortality. So anyone who works about, worries about living forever, you can realize that there's at least one species on Earth that's already solved that problem of how to live forever. Because if you, <laughs> if you, see, a flat, if you see a flat worm today, it's yeah. the exact same worm that existed a million years ago. And, and that's amazing. And in terms of information, it's amazing. Because that means it's, it's also like the better than the best library and better than the best hard drive or memory stick on any computer in the world. Because those things are all going to go dark in a couple decades. Yeah. Whereas the flat the flatworm has preserved all that information for a million years, and there's no way that any computer on Earth today is going to be alive in a million years. So, really, nature is much much better than all of, all of our engineered products. Absolutely. Well, you know, we got to give ourselves some credit not only for our mistakes but for for just understanding a little bit more and a little bit more. It's just yeah. a fascinating time to see how technology and science allows us to to have such an intimate look into the the workings of nature and how how she does things. Um, we don't know how flat words do that, do we? <laughs> well, we don't we don't know exactly, but he he's been able to do some amazing things, like um, uh, in, you know, for example, in in, let me think about it. Let me get this right. In a, he has another species. He also works with frogs. And in a frog that has a, a brain defect due to uh, nicotine, which is what smoking does to create okay. birth defects. So if you, if you have a nicotine-induced brain defect, he can now put in a different electrical pattern in the early tadpole and perfectly recover the brain structure. So wow. he's actually showing, yeah, that he can, we're learning something about these codes so we can actually uh, rewrite um, living structures in wow. a productive way. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, I'm going to go back to what you said about, 
about us and construction and building everything with a lot of heat and a lot of pressure versus yeah. nature doing everything at low pressure and low heat. Yeah. Because that ties into, again, another example of nature versus industrial products. And it's the story of industrial fat versus natural fat. And yeah. apparently what happens is that um, fats have this pentagonal or hexagonal structure, molecular structure. And so when your body receives them, your enzymes know exactly how to kind of dance with them, how to interact. So they know how to hold on to them and they know how to let them go. They know how to release those fats. But when hydrogenated fats are created with heat and pressure <laughs> and hydrogen gas, they lose that molecular structure. They lose that pattern. And so your enzymes grab them, but they don't know how to release them. You know, because it's just a different structure that yeah. your biology doesn't recognize sort of thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, um, <laughs> it's an amazing topic now that you've gotten onto because um, we, we, we've uh, seen many pro scientific proposals to get after this question even more broadly. And it's, the, the word that's been um, created to describe the situation, we call it the foodome. Like we have a genome, now we <laughs> should know the foodome. And we really don't. So you're giving one example of the fact that when we use industrial processes and produce these chemical compounds, let's just call them chemical compounds, yeah. because that's what a hydrogenated fat really is. It's a chemical compound. And you put that chemical compound in your body, you know, um, because you ate it. Well, you have certain enzymes that you've evolved over millions of years to process certain chemical compounds. But that's not one of them. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah, it creates a little imbalance and could create stress or affect your hormones or could affect your growth, might affect you, the ability of your intestine to absorb other useful things like uh, vitamins or proteins and so yeah. forth. So it, could, it can really do a lot of things. But the bigger question is, we don't even know what the chemical composition is of most of the you know, 20,000 meals that are prepared all around the world in every culture around the world, Africa, Latin America, Asia, you know, North America, you know, all these places have their own favorite menus and recipes, you know, and so forth. And we don't even know the chemical composition, you know, in the US, the Food and Drug Administration only yeah. knows the, a few compounds, you know, maybe 60, 80, 100, or some small number of things that they, they're concerned about. But even if you make a simple meal, you know, um, like uh, garlic and green beans or steak with red wine, there's so many things in those menus or in those prepared meals, and we don't know what we're putting in our body. So we can't solve the equation of how our genes interact with those chemical, that chemical equation to yeah. produce a health, health, health or disease. We have no idea. So at least the first step would be we should know what's in these things. And the second step is to figure out how your body processes those things. But right now, we don't even know what we're putting in our body, even in very commonly accepted meals, even if you don't even think about industrial products, even if you just think about more traditional meals. We, yeah. don't, we don't know the chemical composition. You know, they've evolved through, through um, folklore, and, and sort of tribal evolution, you know, tr kind of a trial and error that this yeah. meal is good and helps you grow and be healthy and strong. And this one, maybe not. So it's all empirical. It's all folklore. Yeah. You're talking about the molecular structure of those ingredients or those, yeah. you know, yeah. things. Yes. Yeah. Because we know that collagen is good for, you know, broths or stews made with bones and and yeah. feet, and they're good for your tissue and for your joints and for your stomach lining and so on and so forth. But yeah, it would be beautiful to to understand all that even more intimately. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, what we do know is that the the a fat an industrial fat. So I usually tell my students that it's not a conversation about whether animal fat is better or worse than than plant. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, than vegetable fat, but 
more a question of industrial versus natural because of that example of of how let's say a hundred years ago when it started with cotton seed um, being processed with temperature and heat and hydrogen um, and then a, a catalytic agent uh, I think it was zinc to to make it sort of like a margarine um, and it was like one molecule away from being a rubber being a plastic <laughs> Yeah. So what what's your biology's reaction to that, you know? And and then when that's consumed on a regular basis over a period of many years, you know, what are the devastating <laughs> effects of that in in for your health? Yeah. Well, well that's another yeah. big undertaking, the foodome. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I'm I'm not sure if you uh, if I can give you an answer to that. You know, I'm not a medical doctor, of course. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a scientific researcher, but yes. I think the general answer to what you're pointing out it's a I, it's a big big area, and and we know because a good example is heart disease is the biggest killer in the developed world, and why is that? Because our blood vessels cannot process all of these. I, you know, these fats and other, you know, industrial products that you're describing. Yeah. And what happens is then they accumulate in your blood vessel wall and or they set off your immune cells, which produce an inflammatory reaction, yeah. which then thickens the blood vessel and or weakens it so that you can it can tear and you can have a blood clot and that kills you because your blood vessel in your heart is now blocked by a blood clot that's the sudden heart attack yeah in other cases you have these buildups of fatty plaques all over your blood vessels i mean and this is just the most obvious example and of course now we have the, the diabetes epidemic yeah. why are we having more and more people with diabetes in the developed world it's because we have too much sugar in our diet, obviously from massive industrial production of um, corn and processing into you know corn syrups and things yeah. of this nature. So yeah, I think they all have obvious effects. I think there are many, however, that are not obvious. So I think the, the probably the better approach is not to point or target certain things, yeah. but rather to really emphasize this, um, the importance of diversity in the diet and yeah, in, yeah. in living living in harmony with complex nature to reduce stress, not just in what we eat, but how we actually get exercise and interact with each other as human beings and so forth. All these play into your health, yeah. not just sing, not just single molecules, but I think obviously single, single chemical compounds have done a lot of health damage over the last um, 50 or 100 years. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, clearly, when you go on a on a hike or or into nature in the outdoors, there is biological information flow happening. Yeah, um, yeah, it's not absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even even in this conversation, yes. you know, we know now there's a thing called social cognition, which means ideas and creativity, imagination. They're not just inside your own mind, inside your own head. But actually, in having a conversation or listening to a human conversation, you're, that information is actually being converted into actual chemical changes in your body. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, so anytime you interact with someone, and not just in, a, in an emotional way, whether it's you're learning or you're creating something new as an artist or a, you know, a meal as a chef, and, and then you're talking about it with somebody, you, you actually convey information that changes our chemical uh, processing ability, and we we we're just learning this now, and it's called social cognition. It's a hot area, and I think that'll really grow. That's a fascinating topic, yeah. Um, cause it, it, language is just a, another, like, you know, we could have another episode just on this <laughs> subject. Yeah. Um, because yeah, it's it's just the beautiful flow of how culture becomes your biology and then your biology also becomes your culture and sort of exactly. like this interdependent cycle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Beautiful. Tom, is there anything that you'd like to, to mention that I haven't asked you about? Is there anything you, you'd like to add? No, you know, I think to, to, I guess to end where we started, you know, the whole idea of the fifth revolution, it's really just simple. It's that, Biology as a science is very young. It's like where physics was 
back in the 1800s. And so anyone who's, who's in the food industry or thinking about going into science or a politician making policy has to realize we're at the beginning of a revolution of understanding the complex web of life. And it's going to be an exciting ride. And anyone alive today is going to be part of that unbelievable revolution in knowledge that I think will take us to a healthier way of regional coexistence with nature and that will provide uh, adequate food and water for the world's population. And I believe actually produce much more peaceful interactions among all the people of the world. Because, because after all, that's where conflict come from, comes from, is when resources are, are viewed as being uh, scarce or, or more limited. So Absolutely, it's a, yeah. really an exciting revolution uh, to understand life. Ah, oh, fascinating. Yes, I love it. <laughs> Thanks for for closing with that with that thought. I think it's it's um it's been a fascinating um conversation, Tom, really. I hope we can have another one sometime. Yeah, I'd be happy to. There are many many interesting directions we could take it. Where can people find out more about the work that you do either at the the Paul Allen Frontiers group or Tufts Regeneration or or is there somewhere you you could point the audience to where if they want to find out more? Well, well, uh, I think you've already done that very well. The Paul G Allen Frontiers group is really a very scientific site. Okay. And I've talked a bit about the water games. You know, I could mention a couple of books people might find fascinating. Um, one is called The Plausibility of Life by Mark Kirshner. Mark, M-A-R-C-K-I-R-S-H-N-E-R. Mark Kirshner, he's the head of systems biology at Harvard University or Harvard Medical School. And he's, and he, he's really very thoughtful in this book, The Plausibility of Life, about mm -hmm. how life has evolved and how it will how it will continue to evolve. So that's really a fascinating one. Another one yes. that I could point uh, people to is called The Vital Question by Nick Lane, L-A-N-E, Nick Lane. He's, he's a uh, English uh, scientist. Um, this one is really fascinating as well because it deals with how we've evolved. If you think about it, Sunlight falls on the earth, yes. and we convert sunlight to electron flow, which gives us our life. And so just how, how from the beginning of time, you know, have, have, has life evolved to take advantage of this energy flows, these multi-way multi information flows? That's the vital question. And uh, I think it has a lot to do with how chefs prepare food and how, how uh, resources flow from the earth into our plates, into our bodies, and then make us into human beings. So uh, that's the vital question. And that's a good book about it. Oh, that sounds beautiful. Can't wait to read it. <laughs> All right, Tom. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much for this fascinating conversation. It's been a pleasure. Um, and like I said, I hope we can do it again sometime. I hope we can. Thank you, Thomas. All right, Tom. Have a good one. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Now that was a fascinating conversation with Tom Skalik. We are a small team doing the research, creative direction, editing, recording, and working on getting you this inspiring knowledge in various formats. We need your support to keep producing the podcast and manage our community both online and offline. We'll be releasing a new episode every two weeks. So I invite you to have a listen on iTunes and give us five stars and an awesome review. Please check out our Kickstarter campaign for mastersofregeneration.com and please share it with your networks. Remember, you can reach out to me directly at Tomas at mastersofregeneration.com. My name is Tomas Reyes and my, you spell it T-O-M-A-S. Thank you so much, guys, and I'll see you on the next episode.